Ladies to come forward. Come forth. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Heritage Academy. My name is Cameron Sanders and I'm accompanied by Catherine Green. And we just want to praise the Lord this morning for life, health, and strength. We pray that you would join us in our songs this morning and sing unto the Lord. Our first song will be hymn number 251, He Lives. <clears throat> Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus. Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. stormy blast the day of his appearing will come at last he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to and sing eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King the hope of all who seek him the help of all who fight none other is so loving so good and kind he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to Our next song will be hymn number 338, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. Let's make it beautiful. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Child and forever I am redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. It's child and forever. Just the lady. 
this one, ladies. song will be hymn number 647, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory. Please stand. <clears throat> My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trembling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath he has loosed the faithful frightening of his terrible swift sword. Ah, his truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call me truth. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me as he died to make men holy let us live to make men free while God is marching on glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah glory Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we pray that you will bless Miss Maddie as she brings forth the word. Lead us and guide us, Lord, to draw closer to you. And may we be found faithful, Father, today and when you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. How did everybody sleep? Ready for a new day? Today we're going to continue to to listen to the story of Dr. Kellogg and to understand more about his time that he spent as the director of Battle Creek Sanatorium. Let's see.
In July of 1876, Dr. John Kellogg arranged a health and temperance exhibit for the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, where he was no doubt one of the eager crowd who witnessed Alexander Graham Bell's demonstration of his new invention, the telephone. The exposition was exciting, but for young Dr. Kellogg, the fireworks began in October when he took up his new duties at the Health Institute. I fear this board has made a great mistake. The minute we installed Dr. Kellogg as director of the Health Institute, six of the patients left, and so did Dr. Russell. Terrible! It's a bad situation. Worse than before! Hmm. It seems, Brother Canwright, that Dr. Russell's nose is out of joint with a younger man taking his place as chief physician. But no one has faith in Dr. Kellogg. He's too young. Two more patients left just this morning. That leaves us with only 12. What will happen to the Health Institute? Brother Haskell, everyone, let's not act hastily. I believe the Institute's prospects for success have never been so bright. Let's just wait a while and see what happens. I'm pleased to report to the board that in the seven months since Dr. Kellogg has been director, the financial condition of the Health Institute has improved tremendously. The debt has been wiped out, and the institution has $3,000 in the bank. Yeah. <laughs> Far from losing patients, as some feared, this last winter the institute treated double the number we've normally seen. In fact, it begins to appear that we need to expand the institute. I propose we launch a drive to raise $25,000 for a new building. John, the board members are happy you've agreed to stay as director for a while. Well, at least until we've paid for the new building. With you leading the fund drive, that shouldn't take too long, Elder White. We hope not. Right now, we'd like you to explain why you've changed the name of the Health Reform Institute to the Medical and Surgical Sanitarium. Especially as none of us has ever heard of the word sanitarium. I chose it to show that we use Dr. Lister's sanitary surgical methods to prevent the growth and spread of germs, which Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur have recently proven to exist. Uh -huh, I see. But sanitarium isn't even in the dictionary. It soon will be, Brother Haskell. The name is a variation on sanatorium, of course. The difference is that a sanatorium is a place where people come to get well. In our sanitarium, people will have a place where they can learn to stay well. We hope the sanitarium finances will learn to stay well, too. Good point, Brother Canwright. Dr. Kellogg, I understand that you sometimes have difficulty collecting from patients who are perfectly able to settle their bills. <laughs> well, there was a patient like that recently, Brother Haskell. He made it clear he intended to leave without paying, but he had a gold watch which he kept on his person at all times. I called the sheriff to my office and asked him to attach the watch until the bill should be paid. Now, doctor, how do you expect me to get that watch? I can't pick a man's pocket. Never mind, sheriff. I have a... Oh, oh. here he comes. Hide behind the door, please. Good morning, Mr. Locke. Are you ready for a treatment? But uh, I'm leaving. And make no mistake, I'm not paying. <laughs> you haven't left yet. As long as you're here, we want to do everything possible for you. Shall we go into the treatment room? Uh, sure. Why not? I like the treatment baths. How very kind of you, mine host. All right, Sheriff. You can see his clothes on the chair in there in the treatment room with the watch on top. Good thinking, Doctor. Well, the... Sheriff! Uh, Dr. Kellogg! Yes, Mr. Locke? Is there something I can do for you? For the time being, at least, Mr. Locke, I'm afraid your watch will have to remain in the possession of the hospital uh, until your bill is paid. We, uh, uh, <laughs> okay, Doc, you got me. I'll wire home for some money to pay my bill. He didn't even seem angry when he left. And that, brethren, is how we kept the Enterprise solvent. <laughs> Unfortunately, Elder James White suffered a stroke before the new building was completed, and the money had to be borrowed. 
Dr. Kellogg's one year at the sanitarium became 67 years, and most of the time, the institution was in debt. By 1877, the year England's Queen Victoria was proclaimed Empress of India, Dr. Kellogg realized that the sanitarium had a problem which demanded immediate attention. Good evening, ma'am. Are you enjoying your dinner? <laughs> what there is of it. You find the food insufficient? Uh, what about you, sir? <laughs> Meager and monotonous, doctor. Meager and monotonous. I must see that future meals are more acceptable. If everyone has found a seat, we'll begin our question and answer session for this evening. I plan to make these sessions a regular feature in the sanitarium. Uh, who has the first health question for this evening? Y yes, sir. What was the new food we had for breakfast this morning, Doctor? It was good. Uh, well, that was something I developed in the sanitarium kitchens. I call it granola. Do all of you like it? Oh, yes, it was very good. It's the best stuff I've had in a long time. I wish I could take some home with me. Dr. Kellogg had intended granola for sanitarium patients only, but the demand soon led to a small business. Battle Creek had taken the first step towards becoming the breakfast food capital of the world. Changes were also about to take place in Dr. Kellogg's personal life. On the evening of Washington's birthday in 1879, sanitarium guests who were gathered in the big parlor got the surprise of their lives. It's Dr. Kellogg in his best suit. Look, here comes Miss Ella Eaton, his literary assistant. And she's all dressed up, too. Looks like there's going to be a wedding. But that can't be. Only a month ago, I heard her say she was planning to marry a Seventh-day Baptist young man in another year and leave Battle Creek. Well, maybe that's why Dr. Kellogg's marrying her. He doesn't want to lose such a good assistant. Oh, shoot, 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 shoot. Pastor McCoy is about to start the ceremony. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to join this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Ella Eaton Kellogg was brilliant, a talented author, sanitarium dietitian, a member of the editorial board of Good Health, and an active member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which had been promoting prohibition since 1874. Ella conducted dietetic research in an experimental kitchen she established at the sanitarium. After a six-week honeymoon in Boston, where they prepared two books for publication, the Kelloggs returned to their duties. In May 1879, Dr. Kellogg was promoting health reform at the camp meeting in Emporia, Kansas. Elder White, it's good to see you. How was your trip from Texas? Exhausting, John. Sister White and I... We're happy to leave the wagon train. How's your work in Battle Creek? It's hard getting any cooperation on health reform, especially from ministers. I face so many difficulties and have so much to do, I'll probably work myself to death. And no one will thank me for it. Do what Sister White has advised you. Delegate authority. Don't try to control everything yourself. But Elder White, the only reason I'm involved in so many activities is there's no one else to do them. It's not that I enjoy sitting in an office and running things. What about your brother, Will Keith? Could you persuade him to return to Battle Creek and help you? He has good business training and business sense. Oh, he's too busy running around Texas selling brooms. Besides, he's barely 19. Maybe another year or so. 1879 was the year that another hard worker Thomas Edison invented the first practical electric light bulb. The next year, Will Keith did return to Battle Creek. Newly married Will was glad to take a job as John's personal accountant and business manager. And the brothers worked closely for more than 30 years. In 1881, John spoke to Ellen White about some new religious concepts he was toying with. The acorn falls to the ground and a tree grows. Therefore, there must be a tree maker in the tree. That tree maker is God. God is a part of nature. This great new light is exciting, Sister White. God in us will conquer illness. These theories are wrong. I have met them before. Wrong? 
How? The effect of such teachings would be to make people forget that God is the supreme being, the creator. Nature is not God, and never was God. Never teach such theories in our institutions. Don't present them to the people. This theory of God as an essence in all things is called pantheism. John did not give up the belief, and it was later to cause great turmoil in the church. James White died in 1881. That same year, John Preston Kellogg also lay on his deathbed, making a desperate plea to Ellen White. Please help my son. I, I feel that, that John is in great danger. He does make things hard on himself through his pride and his desire to control. But, Sister White, you'll not get discouraged, will you? Even though he seems headstrong. I love John as a son. You have my word. I'll help him all I can. You're the only one who can help him. Don't let him go, even though his case uh, appears discouraging. Ellen White faithfully advised John to be more humble and willing to take advice from others, to take better care of his own health, to delegate authority, and to share the resources of the sanitarium in helping new institutions get started. Rather than using this money, to continually enlarge the Battle Creek facility. Always, her advice was given with a love of a mother's heart, and Dr. Kellogg considered her his refuge and support. that he was the one that invented the granola, the way we eat them here at the cafeteria, the way the girls are preparing us for us all the time. But it's beautiful to understand and to correlate the history that we have as a country with the history of our church and to understand how much we actually um, try to implement our visions and Sisters White's visions about health and to help the society to understand how to live a healthier life. Thank you for listening with me. Let's be ready for the classes, okay? Let's have a word of prayer before. Heavenly Father, please be with us today. Give us wisdom to understand everything we're gonna have to do. Give us joy in everything we're doing and help us bless your name in all we're doing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.